Our next speaker, his name is Jonathan Gozier. He's a software developer, designer, and inventor, has led a number of successful technology projects across Africa. Um, I'm excited for this presentation. His company, App Africa, has invested in a number of innovation initiatives across the continent. His personal mission, appropriately, is simplify how people work with data. And his topic is going to be very cool. It's can you change Nathan nations through data? Jonathan, come on up on the stage. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is John Gosier, as you heard, and uh, I'm the founder and director of two companies, Africa, which does uh, builds high tech. Uh, capacity to do high-tech work in East Africa, uh, and another company called MetaLayer, which is working to uh, improve the way the world uh, shares, visualizes, and understands uh, information. Uh, today, I'm going to share some observations about how data platforms like our own are changing the way governments interact with their citizens. Uh, so. Uh, this is going on very widespread throughout the United States, many governments around the world, Kenya, um, and I'm just going to give you a few high-level examples of, of how this, these new data paradigms are changing the way people interact with information. But first, I wanted to start with this quote from Jeff Hammerbacher uh, from Cloudera, which says, the best minds of my generation are thinking about how to make people click ads. Uh, and his point there is that most of the web's biggest uh, sort of web scale companies are using their technologies for commerce as opposed to societal change. And this may sound like a bad thing, uh, but it's not, it's not exactly uh, so. It actually has a huge uh, impact on how governments are drawing from these pools of innovation, these new breakthroughs in, in technology, uh, and applying them to different purposes. Uh, so the widest example being open data. Open data is a, a sort of a huge initiative within the NGO space to take the resources that are being collected by massive organizations like the UN, the World Bank, uh, and so on, and opening up those data troves so that any organization, any NGO, uh, any uh, smaller uh, company can make use of that data to inform their decisions and, and drive impact. Um, this is uh, data.un.org. It's one of the earliest examples of this, and uh, it's being used by companies all over the world to do just that. Uh, but what can you do with open data? Well, uh, a lot of uh, really cool uh, projects have been uh, accomplished simply because the data sets are available, uh, opening the data and letting citizens sort of draw the conclusions that they will. This was an article that was recently published in the New York Times that took uh, census data in the US along with housing data, uh, and it overlaid the two to um, visualize the geospatial relationship of various ethnic groups and uh, uh, racial groups in the US to one another. So you could sort of see the, the natural self-selection uh, or whether there are social, socioeconomic uh, uh, reasons that this sort of uh, spread is happening. Uh, and I thought this was a really interesting project. It's interactive, so you can uh, uh, actually click on neighborhoods and drill down to very specific regions to see how this is breaking down uh, and what the, the reasons are for the, the spread. Just very interesting ways that open data can be applied. Uh, another example of how technologies are sort of bleeding over into the public space from the private space, uh, crowdsourcing uh, is uh, becoming uh, increasingly a popular method for working with, uh, uh, for governments to work with citizens. Um, obviously popularized by websites like dig.com, reddit.com, uh, and allowing people, large scales of people to vote on individual items to sort of surface uh, the ones that are most popular. Uh, recently, the uh, current administration in the United States used a very similar um, technology to allow people to vote on policy decisions that would be addressed by government. Um, so uh, ironically, it's somewhat analogous to voting in and of itself, which has always been, you know, popularity decides, uh, in, at least in democracy, uh, decides what the, the ruling vote is. So a very interesting way of applying uh, similar technology to policy. Um, citizen reporting is becoming increasingly a popular way to in interact with citizens. Uh, the company that I used to work for, Ushahidi, being a, a, one of the preeminent examples of this, taking uh, citizen reports, citizen testimony, and in real time, uh, 
showing, uh, giving simple visualizations that indicate to officials what's occurring in a region. So uh, on the left, you see uh, Vote Report India, which was used in 2008 to visualize disruptions at polling stations in India during the uh, uh, presidential election. So whether people were being turned away, whether they were um, observing uh, misconduct at the polling stations, and so on. Um, sorry. <laughs> uh, another example of this is, uh, uh, is in an uh, example of uh, projects like Neighborland, which is a project in New Orleans, which uh, allows citizens to simply state what they'd like to see changed about their neighborhood. Um, as you see here, they have a form that says, I want blank in my neighborhood. Uh, this was actually a public installation project where people actually wrote this on walls, and then the founder of the company, Candy Chang, turned this into a web platform where people could actually uh, sort of um, state these things on a, a larger scale and actually deliver them to the officials on a hyper-local level so that they could uh, affect what was going on in these, these neighborhoods. So not trying to change the entire city, but just like on a block-by-block -block basis, uh, similar to every block, which is another uh, a similar platform. Uh, crime spotting, another example, uh, taking uh, reports of incident across the city and using it to inform police action. Uh, same thing in the UK, police.uk, uh, all examples of how citizen reporting is being applied to government. Um, but there's also some newer technologies that are being uh, applied to this relationship. Uh, predictive technology being one of the more sophisticated. Uh, predictive technologies uh, sort of popularized by uh, companies like Recorded Future uh, take a historical record and uh, combine it with statistical analysis to perform some sort of basis for what will happen in the future. Uh, in this case, there's a company called Flowminder, which is doing just that to predict how regions will be uh, affected by, say, earthquakes or tsunamis uh, before those events actually happen, so that policy can be, uh, and decision makers can optimize uh, their uh, preparedness uh, for such uh, situations. Uh, social media monitoring tools, uh, very popular in the advertising space. So um, uh, projects like Radiant 6 and, uh, and others, TweetDeck and so on, are being repurposed on a large scale by companies, uh, in this case the Red Cross, to monitor global conversations about incident. Um, so here you see, uh, this, was, this picture was taken by a former colleague of mine, Patrick Meyer, uh, that uh, he, he took this at the Red Cross uh, Digital Operations Center, where they're using this these technologies to uh, inform their decisions in real time based on uh, what people are saying across social media channels. Uh, my own company participated in a similar project that actually took, uh, so we create interactive dashboards that simplify uh, working with data. The result, though, is uh, um, insights that actually inform the decisions that, that uh, these uh, industries are making. So in the case of uh, this visualization that you see here, we were working during uh, Hurricane Irene recently in the U.S. to uh, show the correlation between uh, social media conversations and service delivery after the hurricane to see if there was some sort of leading indicator as to whether or not um, that service delivery could be optimized in real time to better uh, serve the public. Uh, it turns out that there was a loose correlation, and they're, they're diving into that more to see if that can be... Uh, appropriated on a larger scale. Uh, complexity science, another new field that's being applied to, the, to these same problems. Complexity sciences essentially take uh, network analysis uh, and reduction methods and apply it to uh, broad networks of problems across uh, various industries. Uh, and what that allows is um, individuals to sort of spot the, uh, the, the commonalities between these very different, seemingly different problems. So in this case, uh, the Vibrant Data Project uh, used um, various, uh, surveyed various NGOs, various public sector companies, and various private sector companies uh, to find what the common, commonalities were between those industries and visualize how impact could be achieved. Uh, it's, it really shines on the web when you're interacting with it, so uh, I encourage you to check it out, vibrantdata.org. Um, you sort of click on these dots and you can see how solving very small problems can potentially impact very big uh, and uh, very broad industries. 
So what these technologies are representative of is uh, new ways for governments to um, engage citizens, and more importantly, for citizens to engage governments. Uh, I mean, the effectiveness of governments to impact their populations depends on this sort of dialogue between the two, the willingness of, of societies to be impacted uh, and, and participate in, in democracy. And so when I think of social movements of the past, uh, like, uh, like you see here, this uh, civil rights movement in the United States, I, I wonder how those conversations might have been changed by some of the technologies that are available now. If the technologies that were used in the Arab Spring were used in the past to affect change then. Um, at MetaLayer, our approach is simply through doing this through visualization. We think that uh, visualization is the uh, easiest way to relate really big concepts to very uh, potentially non-technical minds. Uh, and we do that through various methods of abstraction uh, and simplifying the, the method of actually discovering these insights from, from data. Um, so uh, thank you very much for your time and uh, really look forward to uh, the rest of the festival. Thank you.